I'm with uh, Stroke Neurology, Neurointerventional, and a Neurocritical Care here at Silver Cross. Uh, I live in Mokina. This is, this is my area. I'm thankful that you guys all came out. There's a little bit of snow. It's uh, a little bit harder to get out than, than some of the other days. Uh, not last week, at least, but this week. So thank you. Uh, hopefully, today, I'll give you a little bit of idea of uh, what stroke is about, how to prevent strokes, what kind of things we do when people have strokes. Uh, just give you a little bit of uh, information. This is pretty informal. It's a nice small group. So um, if you have questions, concerns, just raise your hand or speak out. I'm happy to, uh, to stop and, and talk about things, explore things uh, in more or less detail, depending on what people want to hear. All right? All right, so what is a stroke? Well, it's most basic and it's most common. A stroke is an interruption of blood flow to part of the brain. Uh, sometimes an interruption of blood flow includes blood going places it shouldn't go, uh, and sometimes that interruption of blood flow means that the blood just stops and it doesn't go to where it should go. Why do we care, though? Why is it important? Why are you guys all here? Well, a stroke is, a, is an extremely important uh, disease. So it's the fourth leading cause of death currently, and that's only because we're doing well. Just a few years ago, it was the third leading cause of death. So we're improving. All the things that I'm going to talk about have helped. Uh, to reduce the amount of death and the morbidity, uh, the illness and disability from, from stroke. Uh, somewhere in excess of 800,000 strokes we diagnosed this year. Uh, and it's the number one cause of people having disability, people having trouble getting around, or trouble doing something, or not being able to go to work. And it's an extraordinarily expensive disease, both for the healthcare system, for the country, as is always on the news these days, um, as well as for uh, individual hospital systems and uh, insurance companies. So over $65 million are spent related to strokes. Uh, that's from inpatient stays, from rehabilitation, from all of these care costs, including, unfortunately, in some cases, nursing home costs if people aren't able to go home after they have their stroke. Uh, key thing about stroke, and what I hope that you guys all take from this, um, because I'm going to show you sort of modern diagnosis of stroke and all of the fancy technology that we have, and all the things that we can do um, with modern technology and in a, in a modern hospital, like Silver Cross. But the problem is that all of that requires folks to get into the hospital quickly. And so if time, too much time passes, all of those technologies, all of that that we have isn't helpful. Um, we can't reverse things once they've gotten to a point. So acting fast is extraordinarily important. Stroke is an emergency. And unlike people who have chest pain, they feel an elephant on their chest, they know they're supposed to go to the hospital, they know they're supposed to call 911. When somebody's arm falls asleep, they think it'll come back, and so they go back to sleep and, and, and they wait. And that time, as that time is going on, the brain is being damaged, and, and irrevocable, irreversible things are happening. So time is very important, and calling 911 when you think you might be having a stroke, or somebody you know, or somebody you see is having signs and symptoms of stroke, is very important. And I'll get into some of those signs and symptoms in a second here. Unfortunately, less than half of 911 calls for stroke were made within an hour. And that's critical time. Every minute that goes by, the brain doesn't have enough blood flow. Uh, the brain is being damaged. And unfortunately, less than 50% of people call uh, quickly. And of those that call that eventually turned out to be stroke, most of them didn't realize it was a stroke. And so we have a real problem uh, in this country and throughout the world in recognizing stroke and, and therefore in getting the right care fast enough. Um, I can provide excellent care for stroke patients and have a lot of technologies, a lot of medicines, a lot of things that I can do, but if less people get there quickly enough, it doesn't very much matter. So talking to folks like you who talks to other folks, family, friends, um, really is the biggest help overall to stroke to stroke patients. It's not so much what I do, it's that people know and they call and they come in. Um, right. And stroke causes all sorts of different symptoms, and that's because different parts of the brain can be affected. One stroke can affect one part of the brain, another stroke can affect another part of the brain, and because different parts of the brain do different things. Uh, one part does controls movement of, say, the arm or the hand or maybe the, the leg. One part does taste, one part does speech, uh, that's understanding. One part does getting your words out, one part does smell. All these different parts of the brain do different things, 
Strokes tend to cause damage to one part of the brain or another, and so the symptoms can vary a bit depending on where the stroke is. I'll talk about the most common places that can be damaged, the most common symptoms of stroke, but a lot of things uh, can be symptoms of stroke depending on where the blood flow doesn't get to or where the blood vessels are damaged. So, so what are stroke warning signs? And you don't have to worry about getting this the first time. We'll go over it a couple of times. Um, it's common stroke warning signs. So sudden moving from left to right. Sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm, or leg, especially on one side of the body. So that's the usual thing uh, that you hear about. Somebody all of a sudden on one side became weak. Or it just started tingling and they couldn't feel the whole side. And usually it is the whole side. It's the face. It's the arm. It's the leg. It's not just one spot. It can be. Uh, but that wouldn't be common. Usually somebody's whole side goes out. So that's one symptom. Uh, sudden trouble walking, uh, sort of, or in coordination. So where somebody formerly was walking well, and then all of a sudden they almost seem like they're drunk. They're staggering around, they're having trouble reaching for things. When that happens suddenly, that can be the sign of a stroke. Um, certain kinds of stroke come with severe headaches. Unfortunately, other kinds don't. Uh, but some kinds of strokes come with really terrible headaches all of a sudden for no reason. Sometimes strokes will cause vision problems. I see patients who come in who all of a sudden they can't see off to one side or the other. And that can be the sign of a stroke. Usually not a tiny little spot. It's usually something pretty dramatic. One whole side they can't see in. Uh, and another common one is sudden trouble speaking or understanding. That when somebody is having a conversation, all of a sudden the words come out garbled, uh, or they don't seem to understand what you're saying, or they just can't, they can't seem to get their words out. They're going to be very frustrated with that. So these are some common stroke warning signs. Sudden weakness or numbness on one side. Sudden trouble with coordination and walking. Sudden terrible headache. Uh, sudden trouble seeing on one side. Or trouble with language or speech all of a sudden. So this is a common uh, set of symptoms that we ask people to, to check on. If they think, huh, you know, I think this person might be having a stroke. Here's some things you can check. And if you can remember the FAST, that's the, the acronym that we use. So FAST, F is face. So you ask the person to smile. Does one side of the face droop? Is, there, is, it, is that side of the face weak? So it droops. So face, or F. Uh, arm, ask the patient to, ask the person, the friend, the family member uh, to raise both arms. And if one side either can't go up or it sort of falls down, that can be a sign of a stroke. Or speech. If you ask them to, you know, you're talking to them and they, they can't seem to get the words out, maybe you ask them to repeat something or talk to you and they can't do that, that can certainly be the sign of a stroke. And the key thing, as I said before, is time. If you think somebody's having a stroke, let us figure it out. Don't wait and see how things are going at home. Call 911. This is an emergency. Get them in the emergency room and we'll, we'll sort that out. Of course. There are a couple of types of strokes. Uh, there's the most common type of stroke, something called an ischemic stroke. And that's basically where blood, a blood vessel is clogged off and the blood can't get to uh, that part of the brain past there. Um, and I kind of think of that as a, a sink drain being clogged off. The, the water can't go where it's supposed to. Uh, the other kind of a stroke is a hemorrhage, it's a bleeding stroke. And that's kind of like when your pipes burst. Both of them are bad plumbing problems. Um, they have to do with the plumbing. Um, in this case of stroke, they have to do with the plumbing in your brain, the blood vessels in your brain. Uh, either they burst or they uh, get clogged off, two kinds of stroke. The ischemic stroke, or the clog off kind, have some pictures here, shows a blood clot and a blood vessel here. Or sometimes you can have buildups, builds up of uh, cholesterol and plaques hardening the arteries in the blood vessel. And that can block off a blood vessel going to part of the brain here. And if that happens for more than a few minutes, that can start to lead the, to damage to the brain. I mean, if it goes on for too long, that can even be permanent. In the case of uh, the bleeding stroke, the hemorrhagic stroke, in one spot or another, uh, there can be a, a bulging or even a bursting of a, a blood vessel. You've heard of aneurysm, so a bleeding stroke can come from an aneurysm that is burst. And sometimes it's not just an aneurysm, but there's just a leak out of a blood vessel, and it can cause leaking into the brain. This, this is a sort of the normal side, and in this side there's all this leaking of the blood into the brain from a different spot. A 
talked a little bit already about aneurysm, sort of a, a berry or a bulb, a bulging on the side of a blood vessel that then can rupture and lead to bleeding into the brain, blood sort of squirting in, damaging the brain, and perhaps not getting far enough along, and so the, the brain not getting enough blood in some cases. So what can you do to prevent all of these types? Um, and, and none of these are perfect, but these are the things that are, are modifiable. These are the things that you guys can do, um, or your friends or your family can do, to avoid having a, a stroke. The number one is in the upper right here. Uh, as far as the, the one that really makes the most difference, uh, smoking. So it really dramatically increases the risk of both ischemic stroke uh, and hemorrhagic strokes, all the different kinds. Smoking really increases the risk of, uh, uh, of stroke dramatically. And by stopping smoking, it doesn't reverse right away, uh, but within a period of time, actually about six years, you entirely take your risk of stroke down to if you've never smoked before. That's not true of lung cancer, those risks continue, that sort of thing. Uh, but smoking is one of those things you can stop and get, your, get that risk all the way down. Uh, other things in addition to smoking, uh, high blood pressure. So make sure you're seeing your primary doctor, get your blood pressure down by the normal guidelines. Uh, if you have diabetes, Take good care of it. Check your sugars. Make sure that your hemoglobin A1C, your measurements of, of sugar in your body, are down. If you're known to have hardening in the arteries anywhere, especially in the arteries in the neck or up in the brain, now that's something that's going to require additional medicines and probably see a, a specialist such as myself. If you have atrial fibrillation or other uh, unusual heart rhythms, that can increase the risk of stroke. Blood clots can be formed if your heart is not squeezing properly if it's beating too fast or even too slow. Um, and so see your cardiologist, make sure that you're uh, they're taking care of your atrial fibrillation uh, to avoid strokes. Cholesterol, certainly if you have high cholesterol, make sure you take care of your diet. If necessary, take pills. Hopefully your primary doctor is, is taking care of those things. These are all things though that can dramatically reduce the risk of stroke if you take care of these things. Stress is harder to modify. It's in the modifiable category, but it's not always possible the stress in our lives, but certainly try, because uh, it can help. Um, and for those folks who are you know, not doing a lot of exercise or who are obese, any amount of exercise can help. Even if it's you know, walking for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, a couple times a week, that is a, has been shown in studies typically. So you think of oh, just taking a stroll uh, a couple times a week, that actually does have an impact. Uh, and that helps even in people who aren't obese and aren't totally in inactive. Uh, this is something that really can help. Here are things we can't do anything about. Older people are more likely to have strokes. There's more wear and tear in the blood vessels. It's just more likely to happen. If you have a family history, strokes are more likely. Certain races are more likely um, different. Depending on the kind of stroke, gender can make a difference. And if, certainly if you've had a stroke before, you're at dramatically increased risk, and you can't do anything about having had the stroke before, but you can still take care of the ongoing issues, the blood pressure, the smoking, the diabetes, the cholesterol, the atrial fibrillation. Make sure that you're seeing a, a regular doctor, a primary doctor, getting these things taken care of. Um, and if there are further questions, further issues, uh, see a stroke specialist, again, such as myself or any of the other excellent ones here. Let's talk a little bit more about the ischemic stroke. This is the kind where the blood vessel blocks off and not enough blood flow goes down. Um, this is a treatable disease, but every minute counts. Um, the blood flow is blocked off to the brain. No blood is going through. It's like you were in a swimming pool and somebody pushed your head underwater. Every second that you're under that water, you're gasping for breath, you're wanting to come up. And it's the same thing. Somebody at home Although they may be sort of slumped over and one side may not be moving, that part of the brain is screaming for oxygen. You need to get them to the hospital as soon as possible. Because there's part of that, unfortunately, part of the, the damage happens right away. Um, and there's, we can't reverse that. But there's this bigger part, and it depends. Sometimes it's much bigger, sometimes it's a little bigger, um, that is reversible. And if we get you in, we get that blood vessel open, that we can restore all of that function. Um, but if you wait too long, that's not going to be possible anymore. There's lots of things we would do. Okay, so you've done great. You've taken care of your cholesterol, taken care of the smoking, taken care of the high blood pressure, got your atrial fibrillation taken care of, but a friend or a colleague or a family member has a stroke in front of you and you 
know it's important. So you call 911, you get them into the, into the hospital. What are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do um, is, is check for some of those conditions that I already talked about. Talk to the patient or the family member. Find out if they have any of those high-risk conditions. And then we'll do a bunch of high-tech things. We'll get a CAT scan uh, to see if we see a, a stroke uh, or an MRI in this particular case. We may do an ultrasound. There's a whole, a whole set of different kinds of scans, which I'll show you some pictures of, that we can do to try to see a stroke and to try to assess how bad the damage is, how reversible it is, what can we do. One of the things we can do is something called a perfusion scan. And this sort of shows how well the blood is getting to different parts of the brain. This is what you see here and down the lower left with the color codes. And I'll show you some more of those going forward. So the regular CT scan, which is up here, will show us bleeding. And if things have been going on long enough, it might show an irregular ischemic stroke. This is a normal perfusion scan, the, a couple of different ways we look at it. The colors basically look the same when you look from one side to the next. The blood flow is pretty uniform everywhere as it's supposed to be. But in this one, you can see there's this big area here, which is different from the other side. And it, this big area is there on, on all three of these scans. There's a difference between one side and the other. This part of the brain doesn't have good perfusion. It doesn't have good blood flow. A blood vessel has gotten clogged off that goes to that part of the brain. And this is one of the things that we'll do soon after somebody comes in to try to find out are they having a stroke? Where is the stroke located? What's going on? That's an example of a perfusion scan. We can do MRIs as well. In the lower left hand, you see an, an MRI scan. This is an area of stroke. Shows up like a light bulb. Very bright, white spot compared to the rest of the normal brain. This is the area having the stroke. And then we have fancy techniques to look at the blood vessels uh, with an MRI scan. You can see the blood vessels going up into the brain, which would be up here. And we even have ways of color coding it, putting speed limits on things, saying the blood is going very fast on this side, but it's going slow on this side. It's not getting this way very well. Fancy techniques that we have, something called a quantitative MRA, uh, in order to try to sort out how well the blood flow is getting around. <clears throat> okay, so we've brought the patient in quickly. We've done the scans, we've realized it's a stroke. Well, what do we do about it? What are the things that we can do? And as a, a Joint Commission certified stroke center, uh, Silver Cross has sort of all of the options open to it. We have both uh, the standard, um, very important and very helpful uh, FDA approved methods, and then we also have more um, newer, um, less well studied, but exciting uh, ways to try to help people with stroke. So, TPA, or clot-busting drug, is the, is the big one that everybody's heard about. Um, so and there's various rules for when you can give it, but the bottom line is the sooner you get in here, the better. We know it works well up to about three hours after somebody's uh, stroke has happened. Up to about four and a half hours, it works not quite as well, but still works. Anything after that, the clot-busting drug is too dangerous, can't be used. It's uh, actually the bottle says, don't use this after four and a half hours. So again, if you went to sleep and said, oh, my arm's not working, I'm, I'll wait, I'll go to sleep, wake up a couple hours later, come into the ER, it's too late. You can't get the clot busting drug anymore. So it's important to get in as quickly as possible because this is really the best way to try to help out with strokes. I, I talked about a kitchen sink being clogged earlier. What would you do for that? Well, you put Drano down in your kitchen sink. And the clot busting drug, TPA, is like Drano for the blood vessels in the, in the head and neck. And that's what we give. There's all kind of criteria, um, but the bottom line, that's the key thing. So after that four and a half hour period, what do we do? Well, we have other techniques. What would you do at home? If your sink was clogged up and the Drano didn't work, you'd call the plumber. And the plumber would probably put a snake down the drain and try to pull out the clot. And we can do that here as well. Uh, so the same as somebody can put a stent uh, in your heart, we can pull out clogs out of people's blood vessels in their neck or out of their brain. Um, and there's various time uh, courses for this, and there's lots of different devices we can use, whole sets of different things. Uh, corkscrews, like you pull out a wine bottle, you sort of screw it into the clot. There's others that are kind of like little nets, and we can grab it. There's some that are little like pincers. Um, there's others that are little like vacuum cleaners. There's all sorts of things we can do to sort of get up to that clot and sort of suck it out from the inside. 
And I'll show some pictures of that. Even those, though, I mean, there's a certain point at which the clod has been in there too long, too much damage has happened, and even if we get the clod out, the damage has already occurred, and so it doesn't do any good. And so it's still very important, despite having all of these techniques, um, millions of dollars in equipment and expertise, uh, to get in quickly so that you can get the clot busting drug, and if not, we can be effective with these other techniques. All right, so this is a, a vacuum system, an aspiration system. This is a blood vessel in the, in the neck going up into the head. Can you cut the lights in the front? Threading a little tube up. This just tube goes up into the neck. Through that, I put an even smaller tube, which then goes all the way up into the head. Right next, there's the blood clot, right there. I'm taking the vacuum tube all the way up. Sorry. That's all right. There we go. So you're taking a little vacuum tube, and we sort of agitate the clot, and we suck onto it, and we sort of agitate a little bit, and we suck it up with a little vacuum cleaner. So that's an example of getting rid of a clot from the, from the blood vessel. So when we do this, again, the same way that a cardiologist would, would put a stent in the heart, we have to go through the blood vessels. So we put a little needle in the arteries, and we thread drive through the arteries in the body to get up to that. And that's, that's how we do that sort of thing. Um, I'll show you another picture in a second here. I think. Yes, this is another thing. This is a, a different kind of device. That was a, a vacuum cleaner. This is, a, you can turn off the audio. This is a, a device that grabs a hold of the uh, clot from the inside. Just hit mute if there's a mute button on that. So again, here's the clot. We drive our little tubes up inside there. This is just showing what the doctor's doing on the outside. Same kind of thing, we drive our little tubes up there. But instead of sort of doing a vacuum cleaner in this one, we kind of get it stuck in a net. We kind of deploy this net which interdigitates into the clot um, in order to try to pull it out. You'll see that in just a second here. And these are things that you know, five years ago didn't exist. You know, every year there's new technology, there's new techniques, there's new ways of doing this. Here the little net is being pushed right up into there. Well, the net's inside this tube. And they're going to take this tube back and deploy the net. This net right here is sort of getting caught up in the clot. Actually, it's... What, what's the factor that, that you decide whether you're going to get it <coughs> out or use a net or a hook? That's a, that's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, when we finish this video, I'll talk about that in a little okay. bit. So sometimes when we deploy that net, the blood flow starts, uh, but not always. And then we just kind of pull it down, and we pull that stuff all the way in. That's the idea. So great question. Um, and a couple of years ago, we didn't have options. There was one thing we could do. Uh, and it's only in the last couple of years that we have several options, things that we can do. Um, so that's made it um, a lot better, uh, but also more challenging. We have to make exactly those decisions about what's this patient going to respond to. And it, it depends on uh, the kind of clot. Uh, if the clot is kind of hard and chunky, then it won't come into the vacuum cleaner. It just gets stuck, and I'll throw the net around it. If it seems like it's more soft, then I can probably vacuum it up. Um, Although it shows in the cartoon that it's oh, very easy to drive up to these, um, drive up into the blood vessels, sometimes it's extraordinarily difficult to do that driving up there to get all the way up there. And certain of the devices are easier and newer than the others. Um, and so it's a case by case basis depending on how, why that patient, and how that patient's had a stroke, um, and what the rest of their blood vessels look like. All right, so let's talk about a couple of patients that we've had at Silver Cross which illustrate some of these things. Uh, this first one was a 58-year-old lady, had a pretty bad stroke. Um, we use all kinds of special stroke scales to try to figure that out. Had a bad stroke, um, and we did the, uh, the CTs that I showed you before. Um, so in this particular case, there was a side that didn't have enough blood flow. And we could actually see on the regular CAT scan something over here, which is actually the clot clogging off the blood vessels downstream. So it's clot there, clogging off the blood vessels, and then this whole area not getting enough blood flow because of that clot. 
Then we did this angiogram, and I mentioned that we, uh, like the cardiologists do, we'll go into the blood vessels and snake a catheter up. Then we actually inject dye and take a picture. This is the picture. If you're looking, this is looking from the front. Um, these are some of the blood vessels in the head. This is the one coming up in the neck, and then goes up into the head here, um, to the middle of the head, to one side of the head, and to the other. Um, and what you'll see in a minute, it's not clear from this picture, there should be a big blood vessel right here. And it's not there. Same thing. This is a picture from the side, looking just like here. Should be a big blood vessel right there, and it's missing. Here it is, the same picture, the same person with this big blood vessel here that was missing. This big blood vessel here that was missing. So, it's missing here, missing there, now present. In fact, it's so big that it's sucking blood from other places. So this patient then went to the Rehabilitation Institute of uh, Chicago at Silver Cross. So we are full spectrum. We don't just see patients in clinic for strokes. We don't just see them in the emergency room. Um, don't just see them in the hospital in intensive care unit or in the uh, procedure suite, uh, but we have a rehabilitation center here uh, through, with RIC um, who sees them the patients after uh, they've had their stroke. And after this patient uh, went to the rehabilitation center in Chicago here, right in the, on the campus, um, went home about two weeks later with no problem, um, no uh, additional neurological problem, went back to normal, went back to work with no issues. So I mentioned that there's a couple times of stroke. There's the kind where the blood vessel is clogged off, and then there's the kind where the, where the pipes burst. So I'm going to talk about the kind where the pipes burst, the hemorrhagic stroke match. This is a, a picture. This is the, the bleeding on one side of the brain. This is another kind of uh, bleeding stroke, sort of bleeding in all, both sides of the brain, in amongst the various uh, grooves and uh, fissures in the brain. This is something called the subarachnoid hemorrhage. This comes from somebody who has an aneurysm that's burst. I'm going to show a picture of how we take care of somebody who has an aneurysm. So, again, we drive up through the blood vessels, and we actually, this is up inside the aneurysm itself. This is a little aneurysm on the side of a blood vessel, and we're just filling it with little coils. So we fill up the aneurysm, we drive up inside it, we fill it up, and we close it off. And you'll see, this is the normal blood vessel. It's supposed to just, blood flow is just supposed to be going along this line here, but it's going up into this aneurysm. This is just the coil sort of swelling and filling the aneurysm, trying to block it off so there's no more bleeding. Then it heals over, and then eventually heals over completely. And so blood can't go out here and cause bleeding anymore. This is a coiling procedure that uh, we do here at Silver Cross as well. So here's an example of somebody like that. It's a 42-year-old, came with sudden terrible headache. I mentioned terrible headache. It's supposed to be a sign of stroke. This is one example of that. The CAT scan showed bleeding in the brain. Um, we have both neurosurgeons as well as neurologists and folks like myself and, and neurointerventional uh, that can take care of these patients. And so we had a big team of people uh, that saw the patient, uh, made sure the CAT scan was what we thought, um, and then took all the right steps uh, next to try to help her out. So this was the CAT scan, showed bleeding where it shouldn't be. Angiogram, one of these pictures of the blood vessels in the back of the brain. It's a little hard to see. Uh, there's a little blob there that shouldn't be there. It's the same kind of thing, just a colored view right about there. And so we did the coiling procedure. We drove up the, this blood vessel with our little catheters up inside the aneurysm and filled it with coils, just like the last video that I showed you. So filled that all the way up. And so this area is the area filled up with coils. It's all filled. You can see it filled here and filled there. This is what we do when we fix an aneurysm from the inside. And this prevents uh, having to have a brain surgery. The previous way of dealing with aneurysms was to cut open the skull and take it off and go in and, and fix an aneurysm. Now we're able to do it through the groin uh, from the inside. And so the recovery from that, assuming that the initial bleed isn't so bad, the recovery from the procedure itself is a matter of a couple of days as opposed to a matter of weeks or months. 
so this patient recovered at Silver Cross, who watched carefully in the ICU, again went to the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, and was discharged home with no symptoms. And is back to work fully. So that's most of what I have. I'm going to go back over some of the symptoms and then open it up for questions, go through anything you guys may have. So remember that the signs and symptoms of stroke include sudden numbness or weakness, mostly a face, arm, and leg all at once, sudden confusion or trouble speaking, trouble seeing uh, off to one side typically, sudden trouble walking, dizziness, balance, uh, problems, or incoordination, uh, or sudden severe headache. To use this sort of scale, if you think somebody has a, is having a stroke, the things you might want to check at home, have the person smile, see how the face is, have them raise their arms, see if one side goes down, check their speech, see if the speech seems normal or not. And if these first three things don't seem right, make sure you call 911, get immediately to the hospital, uh, because time is very important. And that's the thing, as I say, if you remember nothing from this, just remember that stroke is an emergency. When people have these symptoms, uh, it's extraordinarily important, because after a certain point, we can't do much about them. There's always something we can do, but we can do a whole lot more in the initial stages, and so getting to the hospital quickly is very important. And we do drills, and we run through that to make sure that when somebody presents to the front desk in the emergency room, uh, and hopefully you call 911, so the ambulance calls ahead, and the nurse you know, in the emergency room gets a call from the ambulance, and the whole system is activated and ready for you when the ambulance arrives. But that's not the case, and somehow you, you, know, you walk up to the front desk of the emergency room. They just tell me, I think I'm having symptoms of a stroke, or my loved one is, or I'm having weakness, or this. They train to recognize those symptoms and immediately sort of begin a stroke pathway that we have that gets you back in the room, gets you the, the scans, gets you the blood tests, gets you all the things that you need. Um, and so that's a critical portion of a place like Silver Cross that is a Joint Commission Certified Stroke Center is that you must have that. Um, and not only is the initial care, uh, is there a plan and there's a system that is carefully controlled and optimized, but we have the same thing throughout the entire hospitalization. Not just in the ER, but when you get up to the floor, what gets done, how things work out. So you don't spend weeks in the hospital, you don't have to. You get the test that you need in a rapid fashion uh, so we can figure out what's going on uh, and help you as much as possible. And then again, the end of that protocol, um, the getting to the end of that protocol is getting you to the, the rehabilitation, if that's what you need. If you haven't recovered completely, you get into rehabilitation and that sort of things continue. But even after that, there are stroke support groups here um, and, you know, it's important to get together with other people who have had strokes um, and, and share stories and things that you've learned and learn from each other, um, in addition, of course, to seeing your, your doctor, your neurologist, uh, stroke neurologist, to make sure that even after the acute event has happened and things are, things are improving, that we're always watching and making sure that there isn't something else coming up that's going to cause